I'm interested in your statement. You've said this a few times in, in the media now in the last uh, two or three weeks, and you say it in the book, that Norman Bethune is the best known Canadian in the world. How he, so? He is known by a, a billion and a half Chinese. So if you do it statistically, I think you So in a numbers that. game. In a numbers game. But, but he's not known in Canada. He's because, not known really in the Western world. I mean, you wouldn't walk down the streets of Los Angeles or London, England and say Norman Bethune and expect people to know who he is. Right? No, I'm playing it as the numbers game just because what other Canadian is known by a billion and a half people? Um, <clears throat> there are four great men in modern Chinese history. They are... Edgar Snow, Mao, Zhu, and Norman Besson. And I'm here to talk about humanist doctor called Norman Besson. So despite being the best known Canadian in the world in that sense, he was for a very long time unrecognized, almost neglected in Canada. You attribute most of that neglect to his communist beliefs, saying, and I'm quoting you, it was almost as though he was being blamed for having been raised to heroic stature by the Chinese. The other part of the Norman Bethune history that is not very well known is that there isn't any Norman Bethune history for a huge period of time uh, in, this, in this country, and that, in fact, the head of monuments in Canada says his career has no historical significance <laughs> at, at, at some point in time. Why? Why are, is Canadian history in this period, right until the 1970s, more or less silent on Bethune? Because he was a communist. That's what it was. Yeah. Sir! Sir! Are you a red... Dr. Bethune's story begins about a hundred years ago in Gravenhurst, Ontario. He had an older sister, Janet, and a younger brother, Malcolm. Norman's father was a Presbyterian minister. The family moved from town to town, wherever the Reverend Bethune's church work led them. Norman loved to travel, and he saw life as an adventure. He believed that anyone could do anything they set their mind to. What Norman wanted most was to become a great surgeon like his grandfather. And someday, he would. After high school, Norman worked as a lumberjack, and he taught school in Canada's northern woods. Then came World War I. He was one of the first Canadians to join the Army. His job was to carry wounded soldiers on stretchers to get them to a safe place for medical care. But one day, he was wounded himself and was sent home to recover. In Toronto, he went back to university to become a doctor. I want to go back even, even further. He's, he's in university. He's born and, born and raised in, in Gravenhurst. He goes to the University of Toronto. He wants to become a doctor. But in the midst of his studies, he quits and goes works at Frontier College, which well, is just Well, he had starting. to earn some money, and you did earn some money at Frontier College. You, ta you worked as a laborer right. in the daytime, and at night you taught the illiterate laborers how to read and write, because Canada had this huge growth of immigrants in the first 10 years of the 20th century, which was Bethune's youth, in order to exploit our commodities, the mining, the logging, etc. And so he basically, I think, thought this is the right way to help. So he was with foreigners when he was 17, 18, 19 years old. When he grew up, when he graduated from high school, he was three years in Owen Sound. He graduated from Owen Sound Collegiate. Owen Sound was 10% black at the time because it was the end of the upper of the um, uh, underground railway. Really? I didn't know that. 10% black. And so he saw black people. It was not as though Canada were all white to him. Mm -hmm. And he lived on Harvard Street in Toronto, not far from the Kensington Market area and the College Street, which was teeming with immigrants, particularly Jewish immigrants at the time. So he, it wasn't as though he grew up in this all white, white bread little world at all. He was aware of things and he knew things. And he was, uh, when he went to Montreal, he was even more aware of it because he then worked uh, after Royal Victoria Hospital. He worked in a French Canadian hospital, the Sacre Coeur, at Cartierville, where he became the head of thoracic surgery. Mm -hmm. And all the documents and archives that I have found from those doctors at that time 
uh, and their evidence is that he was a fabulous doctor and that he helped them create what they called La Médecine Québécoise. He went with them to teach at Laval, at Sherbrooke, and he really did, you know, did help people whose language he didn't speak and whose culture he was not part of. Early in his professional career, he developed tuberculosis. This experience influenced his subsequent career in thoracic surgery and his design of thoracic surgical instruments. Oh, he, not only was he a wonderful doctor, he was a really extraordinary pioneer. He in, invented 12 instruments to deal with tuberculosis mm -hmm. and lung surgery. One of them is still uh, in use. It's called the Bethune rib shears, which are great big tree lopper looking things and are still used. And he, you know, he didn't take any money for this. He gave the money for the patents to the technician who put together these instruments. In Canada, he was an early advocate for a universal health care system. And that's why he was um, kind of, um, some people call him a crackpot. <laughs> Maybe he was, but he was 40 years ahead of his time. All he wanted was socialized medicine. He wanted a prepaid medical care for every Canadian citizen. He also in this period becomes one of the first advocates for public health yeah. in Canada and socialized medicine. And he says all health is public. Where does he, where's he drawing this conclusion? From? Well, just from his feelings about human beings and his identification with the poor and the deprived. And he started, started also a children's art school for deprived children in the Depression in Montreal. He felt that helping them express themselves in beauty would help them through the hideous circumstances in which they were living in houses in Verdun and Laval that had no indoor plumbing and probably they didn't get any protein uh, from week to week. But he felt that it was important that they know that what was beautiful was not outside of their purview. He was a great egalitarian. That's really what he was and that's what drove him to say to doctors, we should be civil servants, we should be paid a salary, we should serve the whole of the community and we should not be out for profit. Profit is evil. That didn't make him popular with the medical profession. Well, there's definitely a pattern uh, in his life of sacrifice, of concern for, uh, for, for the poor, linking uh, economy and, and poverty to, uh, to health. But the decision to leave Canada, the decision to become an internationalist, what causes that? I, you know, I think it's because he, uh, because he became a communist. And at that time, it all happens at kind of the at the same, same time. time I think it? the communism was about, you know, Mao talks about it being international. That's an international movement. You know, mm -hmm. workers of the world unite. Of you course. have nothing to lose but your chains. Workers of the world unite. And um, and I think he just saw it as logical. He went to the Soviet Union together with Frederick Manting and Dr. Hans Selye in 1935 to a conference that was organized by Ivan Pavlov, he of the little bells and yes. salivating fame, and uh, wanted to see for himself whether the Soviet Union was doing things better because doctors were not paid, etc. And they all came away quite convinced that medical delivery was very, very good in the Soviet Union at that point. Uh, he was not a socialist. He was in Montreal where the, where the CCF and the, its predecessor, the League for Social Reconstruction, were all fomenting among the elites of which he was a part, the intellectual elites. But he wrote a very uh, sharp uh, letter to a friend about how he, did not be he believed that socialism was namby-pamby because it didn't go far enough. If you were going to go in that direction, then you had to have revolution and you probably had to have violence <laughs> because people who owned things, he meant um, you know, materialistic things, were not going to give them up without a fight. And then he dilly-dallied, did not want to join the Communist Party, felt that it would be too regimenting for him and uh, did not join until 36. And of course, the Communist Party was illegal. Mm -hmm. And there was the so-called padlock law, which was initiated by, um, by Duplessis, Duplessis, which meant that you couldn't gather and you, could, you, know, there was, you were presumed to be guilty of sedition uh, unless you were proven innocent. And that was the law that lay, stayed on the books for a long time until Frank Scott finally was able to get it taken off. But many, many years later. In the Spanish Civil War, Dr. Bethune was the first to introduce the mobile blood bank to the battlefield. Using blood and plasma in refrigerated containers, his mobile units reduced death by shock and made operations possible.
in the midst of fighting. I mean, the, the bombs that were falling on Spain, uh, the, Bethune said, Spain is a scar on my heart. And Albert Camus said the same thing. And anyone who followed the Spanish Civil War, you guys are too young, it was, it was horrendous. I mean, the Germans and the Italians were practicing their bombing and their war machine on the Spanish people, and the West just turned its eyes away. Uh, he had come back from Spain after seven months. He uh, gave lectures for three or four months all across Canada. When we say a, a cross-country tour, he spoke everywhere from Montreal to rouen Noranda to Salmon Arm, B.C., uh, there's Kelowna, Sudbury, Timmins, and he drew huge crowds. At Massey Hall here in Toronto, there were 3,000 people who came to hear him. 5,000 people marched from Union Station to the Queen's Park Legislative Talking about buildings. the danger of fascism? Talking about the danger of fascism. And this, of course, encouraged people to join the Mackenzie Papineau uh, mm. Battalion, the young men, 1,500 right. eventually, of them who joined and went over to Spain and fought on the uh, Republican side. We forget that this Spanish Civil War was so meaningful to people in the 30s here and that we understood that there was, a lot of us understood, Canadians understood, that it was a prelude to a Second World War, that probably Hitler could not be stopped and unless we stopped him in Spain and showed that we cared for something mm -hmm. other than fascism. But of course, you know, our, our government at the time didn't and in, and in fact enacted the Foreign Enlistment Act of 1937, which made it illegal for Canadians to fight in a foreign war. That was aimed directly at the people who went who were going to, who, the, the, to the, the uh, Republican side. That's it. It's as simple as that. Fascism is a germ. It is a virus that carries the disease of fascism, a disease that has destroyed the democratic health of Spain, that has infected the brain of Imperial Japan and the Third Reich in Germany and Mr. Mussolini's Italy that has eaten into their brains and driven them berserk with greed and dreams of conquest. And do not think that you are immune from that disease, that you are safe from it, that it is somebody else's concern far away across the sea. Because the contagion of fascism threatens you here. It is here. I have seen it. I went to Ottawa to request permission from the Prime Minister to recommend a Canadian ambulance in Spain. Permission to recommend an ambulance that would represent Canada in this democratic struggle against that fascist scourge. And Mr. William Lyon, Mackenzie King, turned me down flat. This is the same. William Lyon, Mackenzie King, who has since been photographed shaking hands with the biggest murderer in the world today, Adolf Hitler. After publicly proclaiming himself a communist, renegade Dr. Norman Bethune travels to China in January 1939 to join Mao Zedong and the People's Army in their desperate struggle against the invading Japanese. Bethune took off for uh, China from Vancouver. He was accompanied by a nurse called Jean Ewan. So it was basically Jean and Norman Bethune who trekked hundreds and hundreds of miles by foot, by the occasional railway, sometimes by donkey, to get to the caves at Yan'an where Mao Zedong was based. The trek takes them nearly two months to complete. At 11 o'clock on the night of their arrival, they are summoned to meet Mao Zedong in his quarters. The one and only meeting that Norman Bethune had with Mao Zedong lasted all night long. And it's the source of one of the most famous propaganda posters in the world. They are looking at each other and leaning on the table. It's very significant from an iconographic point of view. He is sitting with another person who is also sitting, i.e. they are equal. That is the only time they ever met. Mao sends Bethune to join the 8th Route Army, the only foreign doctor amidst 13 million Chinese. 
Yes, he was in an army, but it was a guerrilla army. I mean, there were Japanese sometimes, you know, one kilometer away from him, or they were chasing them. At one point, they took all the patients and stuffed them in hay bales and ran out of the village and were just fleeing the Japanese. At one point, he talks about having done 125 operations in four days. The work I'm trying to do is take peasant boys and young workers and make doctors out of them. We have 2,300 wounded in hospital. We're engaged in severe guerrilla warfare all the time. So he was a battlefield surgeon, but he was also somebody who was operating out of the norms, and that's where he was his best, uh, when he was not asked to be in the straitjacket of a structure. He taught his students how to save their own people. The story of Dr. Bethuen soon spread throughout the Chinese villages. His name was shouted like a cheer by the Chinese soldiers. One day, while the guns were shooting all around him, Dr. Bethuen was operating on a wounded soldier. He cut his finger, and the cut got infected. He developed a very serious case of blood poisoning. Dr. Bethuen died on November 12th in 1939. And when he died, Mao Zedong wrote an essay about him in memory of Norman Bethuen within a, a month of his death. And that essay was memorized by every school child from the revolution on. And there are still people who can stop you and tell you, it's only 1,500 words, but still, it's like a great epic poem. It, they, you know, they sh chanted it, they said it. Norman Bethune, they have statues everywhere to him. There's memorial hospitals to him. And he is the great hero because Mao said he embodied internationalism. He was the ideal foreigner in your work. He was the ideal foreigner, and he also came in order to save life. And he found in the Chinese people, and this is what appealed to me writing it, I sort of said to John Ralston Saul, who was the general editor of the series, I'd really like to do Beth Hume, and I saw that there was a list. I said, I'd like to do it, because I think being Chinese in origin, I understand why the Chinese worshipped him. It wasn't just that he came to help them but his character was something they liked. That impatience that he had, that dogged impatience, they took for certainty. Now, you make a very interesting point, that the very things that drew the Chinese to Be Bethune and caused them to, to adore him were the very same things that kind of made him ignominious in, in Canada. Expand on that idea for me. Well, I think he was bossy, and the Chinese liked that because to them it didn't mean that they they were nothing. It meant to them that the person bossing them knew what he wanted to do, and the Chinese respected that. Uh, he was also impatient. He wanted to get things done quickly, and they took that as a level of commitment, mm. that because you wanted to get it done, you were going to get it done. There's a completely different cultural aspect to this. Everything that he did uh, that annoyed people in Canada, uh, they you know, they thought was wonderful. And they didn't find him dominating. They found that he was somebody who knew how to lead, that he was a leader. And when he gave his lectures, because he started in China, he also started these little medical schools. He trained, he was, um, one Chinese person told me he was the roots of the barefoot doctor movement because he trained people who uh, had no knowledge whatsoever uh, as paramedicals and even as almost doctors being able to treat and do things. And he was able to adapt to all of that. And they, l they loved his respect for them. And he did respect them. He found them, uh, his, he found their patience and their, um, their determination to be wonderful and admirable. And I think he showed that to them wordlessly because he didn't speak Chinese. Mm -hmm but he, he gave that feeling, and there is no indication of anything else. He was also followed, because it was, after all, an army, even though it was guerrilla army, by a photographer. So we have a lot of photographs of him um, in those 20 months, where he's lost at least 30 pounds, maybe 40, and looks uh, really thin and bony, not the way he looked even in Spain. 
And I think that the Chinese understood that he was not well uh, a lot of the time with probably dysentery. You know, can imagine the food and the, and the flies and the, the problems they had, and they were in and out of places where people had cholera and typhus. And he was with them the whole time. He never left them. Those 20 months, he was with them. He didn't go for leave. He didn't do anything. He was part of them. And that's why they loved him. Well, I want to ask you a little bit more about that because you say that the eulogy, and that's really what it was, the essay that, uh, that, that Mao wrote, was uh, it was taught to all the children because it was an exercise in character building mm -hmm. for the Chinese. Yes. Mao was trying to change Chinese culture. That's right. To conform yes. to the myth of Bethune. Yeah, he was. And also he was trying to say, look, if you can behave as this man behaves, you will be taken away from the superstitions uh, the con Confucianism, uh, the kinds of things that you've suffered from, we've suffered from in China for so many years that have held us back. In other words, Norman B Bethune is the way of the future for you as a Chinese. Pues Norman Betune eh, lo que hace es ir, ir hasta Almería, el único corredor para huir de Mala era la carretera de Mala de Almería. Él en principio va a ayudar como médico y de, de, para hacer transfusión de sangre si, si lo necesita, pero al darse cuenta de la magnitud de, de, la, de la huida, lo que hace es que eh, desmonta su camión y con todas las instalaciones eh, médicas y durante tres días y tres noches sin descanso con otras dos personas, otros dos canadienses también. También lleva gente, al principio niños, niños exclusivamente. Él eh, cuenta el drama que supone para muchas madres separarse de, de sus hijos y cómo se, se aferran y, y los abrazan, aunque luego al final, pues viendo la situación, pues permiten que se marche. Luego más tarde eh, también lleva ancianos y hasta, que, hasta que, que termina con el bombardeo de la ciudad de Almería por la aviación alemana. 